Today we are going to be talking about my reading for the month of April, which I would say, you know, another kind of like fine month. Uh, I had some hits and we'll definitely talk about that, but a lot of fine things to meh to bad. <laughs> so I don't know. I didn't even include some of the DNFs I had because I picked up a few things and put them back down. Like, I don't know. I just didn't feel similar. This felt like a very similar reading month to last month where it was like, there were some good things, there were some bad things. <sighs> Considering February was my all-time best reading month, maybe I'm just chasing a high that I'll never be able to recapture, but you know, such is life. Anyway, let's talk about my stats and challenges, and then we will talk about my disappointments, my surprises, and my hits for the month of April. So in April, in terms of things that actually made it to the spreadsheet, I read 21 things, 16 of which I own, five of which I did not. I read a total of 6,607 pages, which is a good step down from the last few months, but you know, I think I'm slowing down a little on the reading since it's spring and I'm getting out a little bit more. And the average length of book I read was 315 pages. The average age of book I read was eight years and the average amount of time that it had been on my TBR was seven months. I paid for a third of the books that I read and the average cost to me was $5.19. Looking at genre, definitely my biggest category was mystery, which makes sense given some of the challenges that I had going on. You guys have seen my Goodreads mystery challenge, the first half of it, the second half, I don't know when it's coming, but so I had to read five things for that, though I did DNF one of them. And then I've started on my Japanese mystery challenge. So I read a couple of those and oh my gosh, this is like the bright spot I feel like of my reading life right now. <laughs> so, so glad that that came in and was like some strong mystery vibes towards the end of the month and I can't wait to finish that up in May. Yeah, anyway, so I did, so mystery was my biggest genre. Then I had like a few fantasy, some speculative romance and some horror, it's like were kind of my big ones. I also finished a couple of um, historical nonfiction titles. Also, sorry, there's yard work happening next door, so sorry if that's loud. A lot of, I would say definitely this felt like a mystery heavy month for better or for worse. And then in terms of ratings, peaking at 3.5 this month with some definite stinkers, but that makes sense because like I was saying, I, I felt like a lot of what I was reading was kind of just like meh. And then my average rating for this month was 3.4. Anything over three I think is doing okay. I would say relative to the rest of this year though, that's pretty low. So that's probably part of why I have been feeling like it wasn't the most exciting month. In terms of challenges, I think a lot of what I would want to talk to you guys about, I covered in my mid-month check-in. So I read all of the arcs that I read in the first half of the month. So I would suggest going and checking that out to find out about, let's see, Witch King, Love Theoretically, Resonance Surge. I guess those were just, those were the three that I read for arcs. Yeah, if you go and, and check that out, I think that'll give you some insight into like my five star prediction update as well as buddy reads. And then like I mentioned, I did do that Goodreads mystery vlog. So I read five things for that and then starting on the Japanese mystery project right now. So yeah, I guess those are all my challenges. You know, I've been slagging off on my Nora Roberts reading. I was supposed to read Identity in, in April and it just kind of got away from me. So hopefully in May, I will. I'm going to read that because I have an advanced copy, but also hopefully I will catch up on some other reading Robert's stuff because, you know, the books keep coming, so I've got to keep reading. Okay, with that, I guess we'll go ahead and transition into disappointments. I would say I had two notable disappointments, one of which I have a book club discussion I can point you to. So this was the worst thing I read this month, which is Splendid by Julia Quinn. This was for the Blades and Bodice Ripper book club, which Amanda hosted this month over on her channel, uh, which is the Naughty Librarian. We're dressing up for those now, which I have so much fun making my costumes for. I made like this, you know, Regency dress meets 1970s prairie dress, so it's a little more wearable, so I can wear it again. So I had so much fun doing that. But anyway, that was definitely, that and the conversation was the highlight of this book experience, because this is not good. So 
this is not good in way in a way that I could have put this as a surprise because the way that this was not good surprise me. It's from 1995 and it's her debut. So like trope wise, I knew this was not going to probably be a favor for me because historical romances from this era, unless they're Julie Garwood Scottish historicals, and even then I have problems sometimes with the gender dynamics. It's just not for me. And it's because I'm already a hard sell on historical romance in the sense of I'm constant, unless there is a lightness of touch, or it's like a Courtney Milan kind of approach to it. I'm just constantly so aware of the fact that the woman involved in this romantic relationship has no power and that she is completely at the, she is a subject to whichever man like owns her in that moment. And I know that's extreme, but I just, it's very hard for me to relax my mind and like enjoy them having a romance together if I'm just constantly worried about like, well, but like, what if he does reject you and you've, you've slept with him and now you're, you know, disgraced or like, you know, if it's with working class people of earlier eras, I'm just like really worried about their economic precarity. Like, it's just hard for me to, to get into a romance historically in general, which is why I tend towards some of the like more comedic or like campier versions of historical romances. That's what tends to work a little bit better for me because I, there's enough of a suspension of disbelief, like I'm just not worried about some of those like macro forces. <laughs> and so like already this was going to be a little bit tough for me, right? The way that this surprised me though is how poorly written this is. <laughs> so I'm just talking not even... So this was published by Avon. This is a mainstream published book that has like not just developmental editing problems in terms of, you know, character consistency or, you know, kind of some of the more advanced editing things that I would expect from a traditional publishing house to provide. I'm talking like just even strictly on a line editing level. The number of read on sentences in this is shocking. And then there's constant head jumping in the point of view, like just from a technical editing perspective, this is not good. And it's a debut. So like, I, I guess basically in a debut, you just you need a little stronger editorial hand sometimes to make sure that these things don't happen. So like that was also just distracting. I didn't, I found the main characters both unlikable and boring, which is just really a, a sin. <laughs> like at that point, what am I reading this for? So there's just, if this, I think in my review on Goodreads, I put something like, if this was on Kindle Unlimited and I was not expecting there to be like a strong editorial presence to make sure that some of these kind of like base level things are getting fully addressed, I probably would have given this two stars because it's just like kind of standard historical romance. He doesn't think that he can have real feelings, but he looks at her and he's like, ah, you, I feel like you're an actual human that I could love. Whoa, I didn't know I could feel that about a woman. Like, it's just that kind of basic whatever. She's from Boston. I don't know. I, it, it, it would be fine, but those, those editing things made it worse to me. <laughs> So for that reason, I gave it a one and a half. I would not recommend going back to Julia Quinn's early works. Oh, also if consent is an issue for you, which again, like in these books, it's a different time in terms of like the, the kind of expectation of how consent worked in these books in terms of like, there's some literary theories about the reader giving consent to the woman because she, it, a lot, there's a lot of like forced seduction or dub con that is not read as that in the text. So anyway, there's also that. So like, if you don't like that, don't go back. But also, I just don't think that these are good. Like it, I, the Bridgerton books that I've read, I think I read um, one at some point. It was, I didn't love it, but it was much better than this. So maybe don't go back it, unless you're just like a Julia Quinn purist. And then I DNF'd, I have some questions for you. This has been a big book. Like this has been really pushed. I've seen this like prominently displayed at bookstores. Um, I've seen a lot of social media coverage for this. It's been on a lot of lists. So like it's very clear that the publisher is pushing this as a big book of the season, you know, or for this this year, I guess, a, a big book of the year. The writing I cannot deal with. So I, I should say, first of all, it is pitched as being some kind of mystery thriller. I've seen it on several lists for that. I wasn't aware of that because based on where I saw this 
being placed, I thought that it was like general fiction. And then Meg from Meg with Books made me aware of like, no, no, this is being pitched as a mystery. And then when I had that lens on it, I started looking and was like, oh yeah, people are putting this on like hot new mysteries of the year, hot new thrillers of the year. It is, it, it has some of those trappings, but I think if you are a thriller reader, this is not a book for you. This is, this is lit fic that is trying to engage with ideas about like true crime and our obsession with missing and dead girls. Like it has some big picture ideas that I frankly think have been done well in things that are actually thrillers. <laughs> so I don't think it's bringing, from what I read, I DNF'd it at 20%, so there's a caveat. I, it wasn't bringing anything new to the conversation from that perspective that has, haven't been done by things that are actually that genre and, and therefore have like a higher entertainment factor, which is what a big part of what I'm coming to a mystery or thriller for. And then if I was going to switch over to thinking of this as lit fic, I would have to enjoy the writing. And I hated the writing. The writing was so bad in my opinion. Just stylistically, it's not for me. It has the these declarative staccato kind of sentences that I find really self-consciously mannered in a way that doesn't work for me. The example I gave when I was talking about this in the blog was, you've heard of her, I say, a challenge, an assurance. Uh, further down the page, the one with the uncle? Wait, the other one with the uncle? No, it was the one with the swimming pool. The one with the alcohol and the, with her hair around, with the guy who confessed to, right, yes, they nod, comforted. By what? It's just very mannered. Like when, and what I mean by that is, it's the kind of writing that's drawing attention to itself, which sometimes I can get into, but not this flavor of that. It's just not for me. So if you are more of a lit fic reader, if you haven't read a lot of books that are kind of interrogating the ethics or morality or what it means about us as a culture around true crime and obsession with thrillers, um, and also, you know, like racial injustice in the system, because the person who originally went away for the crime in question um, was a black athletics coach at this elite boarding school. So I think it's also trying to get into like interrogating some stuff around that. If you've not read a lot of books like that, and you're more of like a lit fic or a general fiction reader, maybe this could be a good choice for you. If you are looking for an entertaining thriller that's well written, this is not what I would recommend because I don't think that's really what this is. So disappointing, DNF. It's a big book, but it's not a big book for me. And not one that I would particularly recommend to very many people, honestly. Saying this, it kind of makes me wonder why they decided to make this the one they were going to push this year. But what, you know, who knows what's happening in the minds of big publishing. Okay, then two surprises I wanted to talk about, um, neither of which I loved, but both of these I found interesting in their own way. The Plot by Jean Humph Korlitz. This is another one in that vlog I was talking about for Goodreads mysteries, like popular Goodreads mysteries. This is very mannered and very meta, and I didn't like it, but I respect its project. It's uh, the setup, I don't think actually makes sense. I, somebody mentioned this in one of the comments of the video when I read this, and I was like, yeah, I should have mentioned that because I also thought that that was kind of nonsense. The idea is that there's this uh, MFA writing teacher who has a student who tells him the plot, and as soon as he hears the plot, he's like, oh God, that's gonna be a bestseller. The student dies, he takes the plot from him, writes the book. It is this massive bestseller. Someone is like blackmailing him about that and he's trying to figure out what to do. So I agree with the person who in my comments who said like, what do you mean? Like how, this doesn't even make sense in terms of it's not just a plot. Like what is this plot? that would make it instantaneously like, oh, that's a bestseller. I do agree with that. And I, I, you know, I was interested in the, it's a book within a book. So the book that he writes with the plot is Crib. And I thought that was interesting. Like I liked a lot of that. I guess I was just, I didn't like this. And I'm kind of surprised I didn't because it does have that meta textual element, which is something I normally am very into. It has a book within a book, which is something that I'm normally really into. And it's very dark and campy, which is a vibe you guys know I love. But the way it came together, it did not click for me. The, the writing didn't ring well in my ears and it just wasn't for me. And I'm just a little surprised by that. I would have thought that I would like this more. I do respect it as a project, but I did not enjoy it. So for that reason, I gave it two stars. And I'm just surprised, frankly, that I didn't like it more than I did. Then Corinne is the other surprise I wanted to mention. I just keep bringing this up because at every turn, I want to point you guys back to the live stream that I hosted on this because we had such a good time. It was very funny. And 
I just had a great time doing that. It's one of my favorite live streams I've done, so definitely go check that out. I'm also proud and surprised to discover that I have kind of kicked off like a little mini series about Corinne here on BookTube because Ashley from Bookish Realm, Marie from My Name is Marines, uh, Bethany from Beautifully Bookish Bethany, and Rachel from Reads with Rachel all made their own videos about this, which I will link to below. And uh, we have, I think, cracked the code of who this is. So the whole setup is that Rebecca Morrow is supposed to be an anonymous New York best-selling New York Times author. Now I do love Bethany's pow pow fish conspiracy theory. I am a pow pow fish truther, but I actually now we've gotten I've gotten some anonymous information. I've gotten some things in on the tip line, and that combined with the research from my other co-hosts and I won't spoil all of their research. You should go watch it. I am now convinced that this is Rainbow Rowell. I'm going to tell you I think Rainbow Rowell needs some therapy. <laughs> so I think that there's some things she can process. I will also mention somebody commented and then we looked at this and they were right that since our live stream the publisher has taken this off of kind like ebooks and audio digital like all the digital stuff is gone did we get did we hit a did we fly a little too close to the sun did we hit on a nerve here have we cracked the code that this is either a cabal <laughs> authors or this is Rainbow Row. I don't know. Anyway, I didn't love this book. I ended up giving it three stars because as a romance, which is honestly, I think how a lot of people have read this, this is a negative 10 stars. This is one of the least romantic romances I've ever read. And the ending of it is so bleak and so sad. It, it's a lot like the end of The Graduate, that movie. It's one of the saddest endings that I've ever encountered, even though the main character is getting what they want. It's not rom it's anti-romantic that I stand behind. But as an exploration, especially the early part of this book when it's exploring growing up in a fundamentalist, high control Christian sect, I thought that there a lot of that rang really true. All of us who were on that live stream have some kind of experience with that kind of religious background. And so yeah, I thought that that was really well observed. I think once she became an adult, it became very unpleasant to read about her and Enoch Miller. And uh, I feel bad for anybody actually named Enoch Miller out there because I feel like this book is dragging your good name through the mud. <laughs> so I, I don't know if you're like a cinder block shaped uh, fundamentalist, but this this book is doing you no favor. So, you know, th it wasn't... <sighs> I think it I think that if you read this as self aware, it's a much better and more interesting book. But I do still think even then, I don't know that the author is fully aware of everything going on. So I don't know. Anyway, interesting book, a lot of interesting conversation around this and surprised me that this has just been an ongoing discourse. Um, so yeah, anyway, I very much enjoyed the experience overall of reading this, even if the book itself is not a favorite. But the tip line remains open if people have uh, anonymous information confirming or denying our theories, we would appreciate that. Okay, so then we have two hits I want to talk about. First of all, The Fabric of Civilization, How Textiles Made the World by Virginia Postra. I did talk about this some in my what I'm reading right now video. I listened to this on audio, which I do think works well. I picked up the book because I ended up giving this four and a half stars. I this is one of my favorite nonfiction things I've read this year. I also picked it up hoping that there would be some like pictures and there's not really like there's a couple but that's kind of a bummer. But anyway, I think that this, this book in combination with my experience and journey of learning to sew and doing research on how to make different things, it's just giving me such a wonderful appreciation for the technology that is textiles, that it's like one of our earliest technologies as a species that it's just, I don't know, I think it really, even aside from the things that I knew about something like fast fashion, reading about the history of how we've even come to have the fabric to make something like fast fashion makes me understand just like how, un like it, it, books like this deepen my understanding of how unethical it is to have something like fast fashion and how wasteful and how it completely disrespects, even aside from the work, like it completely disrespects the workers, but it also completely disrespects like the human journey to create fabric. This is, the, this is the kind of book that makes me think about that. So anyway, I think that this is super interesting. This covers a ton of different topics. So like archeology span and social history and science history, like because this is really a story of technology development, it just hits on it, it covers the entire globe 
and it hits on so many different types of history. So I enjoyed that aspect of it. And even if you're not somebody necessarily interested in like fabric arts or textile creation or sewing or whatever, I think if you just like history and you like that kind of history that encompasses a bunch of different disciplines, I think that this could be a book you really enjoy. So I'd seen this on some best of the year lists. I know people had recommended this to me in the comments. I'm really glad that I finally got it from the library because it was a big hit for me. And then I would say my biggest hit of the month was the Decagon House Murders by Yokito Ayatsuji. This is a Japanese cult classic mystery. And this is actually the beginning of a series. And I didn't realize that both this and the Hanjin murders that both of them have a new translation entry in the series coming out this year. So even though these are really old in Japan, like they've been around, this series has been around since the 40s. This I believe started in the 80s. They're just, some of them are just getting translated into English. So I'm so excited because I just happened to read this a couple weeks before the next one comes out, like the day I'm filming this the next entry in translation comes out tomorrow. I can't wait for, I pre-ordered it. Can't wait, can't wait for that because this is just candy for me. It is a just a classic isolated close circle mystery thriller situation. And on top of that, it's extremely meta because the people who are involved in this isolation thriller, they're at, on this island cut off from everyone for a week. They are all a part of this mystery club at their university. So all of them have nicknames of like different famous golden age of detective fiction authors. You know, they are very aware of the kind of story that they're in. So that I thought was really just satisfying if you are a big mystery reader. And then it is intercut with a different point of view, which is on the mainland, some of the people who didn't go on the trip who are in the club get this threatening letter that tips them off that there might be something happening. And so they're doing sort of an investigation into the backstory. So while it's not, it doesn't have the same sense of menace, I think that a lot of traditional isolation, isolated close circle mysteries do in terms of some of the like pacing, which is probably my biggest critique of this is the overall pacing of it. It doesn't have that same sort of like inevitable, like delicious, like, ah, like you can't escape your fate kind of pacing. I do think that overall, this is such just candy. If you like this kind of story, even if it's not a favorite of yours, I think that it will deliver that component in a way that's fun. So this is one I feel really really great about recommending to people in the sense of even if you don't end up loving it, I think that you'll just get some level of entertainment out of it, even if it's not a favorite. For me, I think just all of the things I love coming together in one book so well made this a favorite. Uh, even if I, I don't want to get into spoilers. There's some particular plot elements that I had some critiques of. But even aside from that, I just had so much fun reading this. And I love that this was just a love letter to people like me who love Golden Age of Detective Fiction, love this trope, and are very aware of the canon of these kinds of books. So for me, big hit. What a way to start off my Japanese reading project for mysteries. I have really enjoyed both of the books that I've read so far for this. So like my manifestation of a new region and sort of canon to read is coming to pass and I'm loving it. I'm like doing a lot of this book and the other one I've read so far made me like look up a bunch of stuff about Japan, which I think is also really cool and a part of the joy of reading books from a culture you may not be familiar with. So yeah, I just love this. And this is overall the bright spot of this month, this pro beginning this project and getting so excited about like, ah, oh, I think I found new things to love or a new type of book to love. So big hit here, biggest hit of the month. So with that, I think that will wrap up my reading for April. I definitely started slowing down towards the end of the month. And I think that that will continue through the summer. I'm thinking about doing something like slow summer where I just purposely lean into kind of taking my time a little bit more. But we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Let me know what you thought of any of the books that I talked about today. Let me know how your reading went in April. And yeah, I think that will do it for me. So if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, follow me on the social means if you are so inclined. I have all that information listed in the description box below, and I think that that will do it. I hope you're having an absolutely lovely day today, and I will just talk to you soon. Bye!